Hello everyone. Tonight we are going to explore the history of various ancient or at least old mysterious objects that are called out of place artifacts. Out of place because they were found in an unusual context or they suggest a level of technical advancement from an ancient culture that challenges conventional historical chronology, or sometimes because they hint at contacts between cultures that were not thought to ever have been in contact. In other terms, these are artifacts that should not exist should not exist, provided they are real, and were correctly dated and appraised, because this is generally at the core of their mysteries. Fakes and hoaxes abound in that field. I will tell you about various cases of forgeries or biased interpretations that sometimes were in the news for a short or a long time. Some of them retained a bit of fame even after they were debunked, like the so-called crystal skulls, supposedly from pre-Columbian America. Many other cases have explanations. They could have been placed where they were found by travelers centuries or even millennia after they were made. But there is a small number of such artifacts that retain a part of mystery or invite us to rethink our view of a culture's technical advancement. I will insist on some of them. They include the Shroud of Turin, an ancient large cloth which contains an image that resembles a photographic negative. It was kept and still is kept as a relic because it was believed to be the burial shroud in which Jesus Christ was wrapped after his crucifixion. Various investigation methods, including radiocarbon dating, established that the shroud was most probably made during the Middle Ages. But it still retains a part of mystery, starting with how this negative image could be created. I will also tell you about the Iron Pillar of Delhi, a big metal column that was made around the 4th century AD. What is surprising about it is that it is rust-resistant due to its composition, which, if intentional, would suggest that ancient India had a much more advanced knowledge and know-how in metallurgy than thought. I will also discuss the Antikythera mechanism, an ancient form of mechanical computer but created around the 2nd or 1st century BC, probably by ancient Greeks, that reveals a design capacity and a degree of sophistication in engineering that was not thought possible. We have a lot to discover and discuss, so please make yourself comfortable Let the tension go in your shoulders, now in your limbs, and don't hesitate to close your eyes at any time if you feel like it. You always have timestamps to come back later if you fall asleep. In the description and the first comment you will find them together with the links to audio streaming platforms where you can also listen to my stories, a link to my Patreon page 
if you wish to support this channel, which is always very much appreciated, and a link to Lights Out Library, which consists of my stories, edited and retold by Sarah in American English. I invite you to check all this. But for now, take a deep breath and let's get started with our stories. To begin with, I'm going to tell you about these mysterious crystal skulls. During the 19th century, interest in ancient civilizations of the world grew exponentially in Europe and in America. Not just interest in familiar Mediterranean and Middle Eastern culture from Egypt, Mesopotamia, Greece or Rome, also in more mysterious or exotic cultures because they were from faraway regions of the world, from East and South Asia, Africa or America. There was scientific interest from archaeologists, historians, backed by universities and museums, trying to grow their collections, and also private interest from amateurs, travelers, collectors. The thrill of discovering ancient artifacts and secrets in tombs lost in ruins covered by the jungle or the desert sand. This was exciting, and it didn't take long before it turned into a business, a business that was not entirely new. The traffic or procurement of Egyptian mummies or supposed Christian relics was something that had existed since the Middle Ages. But it took a whole other dimension, and often with sad consequences. Many sites were literally looted before they could be studied, stripped of their statues, and any artifact that could be of interest for museums or collectors. These objects were purchased or stolen, then shipped, sometimes smuggled, to Western Europe or America. They ended in many public and private collections. Antique dealers specialized in this business and provided wealthy curious and collectors with these mysterious or evocative artifacts. It is in this context that small crystal skulls said to come from Mesoamerica attributed to Aztec or Maya civilizations, appeared on the market. These were very different from known pre-Columbian Aztec and Maya artifacts. A lot of different objects coming from these cultures were already well known, from ceramics to masks and jewelry but no crystal sculptures like these. Maybe several dealers offered them, but the most prominent was a French antiquarian specialized in Mesoamerican antiques, Eugène Bauban. He was seen as an authority in the field because he had spent many years in Mexico and spoke fluent Spanish and Nahuatl the language of the Aztecs that still was and still is spoken in central Mexico. He had provided many authentic pre-Columbian antiques, was part of a scientific commission too, and all of this made him a credible, well-established antiquarian. In 1870, aged 36, he opened a shop in Paris and kept managing this business between Mexico and France for
for three decades. Among other objects, he sometimes had these crystal skulls on offer. We don't know exactly how many he sold, but several that are now in museums were traced back to him. For example, one that is now at the British Museum in London. This one skull appeared in 1881 in a Bobon's shop. He tried to sell it as an Aztec artifact to Mexico's National Museum, but the offer was rejected. So he turned to New York City, where he sold it to an American entrepreneur. The skull changed hands and then ended up in an auction where it was bought by uh, Tiffany & Co, the jewellery house, and Tiffany sold it to the British Museum in 1897. Three other skulls were sold to a French ethnographer who donated them to the Museum of Man in Paris, an ethnography museum. These skulls were not very famous at the time, they were known essentially in a small circle of archaeologists, antiquarians, collectors and museum personnel. But they raised a question, a mystery, and this is why they can be associated to the group of out-of-place artifacts. They were very different from other Aztec or Maya artifacts because no other carved crystals like these were known, and because of their precision and craftsmanship. They were made of quartz, and that type of quartz it's not easy to work with, to carve. It requires precision metal tools, even using diamonds to overcome the hardness of quartz without breaking it. Their polishing was also technically complicated. And this put the skulls apart from other pre-Columbian creations. The technical complexity, the craftsmanship, was hard to reconcile with other objects produced by these cultures and with what was known of their technical advancement. If real, these skulls would have forced the scientific community to reconsider the technical advancement of pre-Columbian craftsmen or discover unknown techniques that could have given this result with the tools known in the region centuries ago. In short, the existence of these skulls was a real mystery. And this could be why, in the early 20th century, as they were now exhibited in large museums, the skulls began to rise to fame. First, because of the interest of occultists in them, that started to claim that they could produce a variety of miracles, from curing diseases to killing people at a distance. The adoption of these crystal skulls by paranormal enthusiasts was boosted by the emergence of another skull, probably the most famous of all of them, the so-called Mitchell Hedges skull. It is called Mitchell Hedges after a British author and adventurer, Frederick Albert Mitchell Hedges. From the 1940s, Mitchell Hedges and even more his daughter, Anna, started to claim that they had discovered a crystal skull inside a temple in the 1920s, during the exploration of a temple in Belize, at the time British Honduras. And this skull would have been buried under a collapsed altar. They still owned and showed the skull 
which was very similar to the one kept at the British Museum. We were in full Indiana Jones territory. The complex artifact, found in the crumbling ruins of a lost temple in the Central American jungle. Exciting. Anna went on to make claims about the supposed powers of the skull for several decades after her father's death. Claims like, for example, that she had been told by the locals, the descendants of the Maya, that the skull was used by high priests thousands of years ago to will death on people. For this reason, the artifact was sometimes referred to as the skull of doom. Anna Mitchell Hedges maintained that story until her death in 2007. It could even be said she milked that story. She toured with the skull and exhibited it on a pay-per-view basis. She gave interviews and occasionally she came up with new details for her story. But was there any truth to it? No. And we know it, first because the skull was not found in 1924 in Belize, as Mitchell Hedges and his daughter had claimed for so long. The skull had been bought at an auction in London in 1943, 19 years after its alleged discovery date. This is established because Mitchell Hedges wrote about this purchase in his letters at the time, and the records of the sale were found at Sotheby's, the auction house. Second, because the skull is not ancient, neither. Its examination with microscopes revealed that its surface had been worked with a high-speed hard metal rotary tool coated with a hard abrasive, such as diamond, which happened to be exactly what a 20th century crystal cutter or carver would use. For this reason, the skull was dated to the 1930s. It would have been brand new when it was purchased in 1943. And given its similarities with the British Museum skull, it is believed to be a copy. Something relatively easy to do. Because the British Museum skull had been continuously exhibited since 1898, so anyone could go see it. It is uh, unknown whether they invented this tale about the crystal skull for attention, maybe for money, or for fun, maybe a bit of it, and also whether Anna ended up believing it or not. In any case, she hanged on to her story until her death, but evidence that it was a hoax is overwhelming. Now, if this skull was a modern forgery, what about the other ones? Since the 1960s, the other known skulls at the London and Paris museums have been studied with precision microscopes to examine how they were carved and experts have analyzed the quartz they were made of to know where it could have come from. Quartz is not perfectly pure. There are micro-inclusions of other materials that can help determine where it might have been extracted. And in this case, the analysis of this particular type of quartz indicates it most probably came from either Madagascar or Brazil. That is to say, thousands of miles away from Central America. And uh, as it happens, 
European workshops in the 19th century crafted objects with Brazilian quartz, especially workshops in Germany. These objects were made with the modern tools of the time of the mid-19th century, and when compared with other quartz objects made in Germany at the time, the skulls from Paris and London appear strangely identical to them, in terms of techniques and the tools that probably served to make them. This is why it is now believed that all the skulls that surfaced in the 19th century were made in Germany with Brazilian quartz, possibly in limited series for Eugène Bauban, this antiquarian who regularly discovered one. If this is true, the explanation is basically that Bauban scammed wealthy clients with artifacts that he secretly ordered or bought in Germany. In any case, the skulls are not ancient, and the most recent one, the Smithsonian skull, appeared only 30 years ago, in 1992. In 1992, a box was mailed anonymously to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. And this box contained another crystal skull, a bigger one. The Paris and London skulls are a few inches high only. This one is 15 inches high and weighs 31 pounds, 14 kilograms. The anonymous donor claimed that it was an Aztec object. By the way, Aztec and Maya, which are the two cultures these different skulls were attributed to, were quite far apart, geographically and in time. They were part of the same broad civilizational area in Mesoamerica. But the cradle of Maya culture was in the south of Mexico and Central America, whereas the Aztecs emerged in Central Mexico, to the north, and they became a powerful empire shortly before the Spanish conquest, centuries after large Maya cities had declined. So these are clearly distinct cultures. This other skill the one from 1992, that is now part of the Smithsonian collection, was also examined, and it was established that it had been carved using carborandum, a modern appraiser that was not available to jewelers and gem cutters before the mid-20th century. This skull is modern and it is exhibited as such by the Smithsonian, as a curiosity and not an ancient artifact. Even though all the known skulls were debunked one after the other, in the past few decades, their fame had already been established in the paranormal and uh, entertainment world. But there is no known trace of such skulls in the mythology and religious practices of Native American peoples. All these claims were made by outsiders from different movements like the New Age movement or the so-called Neo-Shamanic movement, which refers to shamanism practiced by people with a Western cultural background. These are contemporary forms of spirituality that appeared in the 20th century. And when it comes to the skulls, it seems these claims took a lot of inspiration from the anecdotes invented by Anna Mitchell Hedges. We don't know how many skulls were made and sold. Some authors close or part of the New Age movement spoke of 13 skulls, and often claimed that these are relics of ancient Atlantis. 
But the ones that are identified are the ones in London at the British Museum, in Paris at the Museum of Man, in Washington at the Smithsonian. We also know that there is another one in the US, the Mitral Hedges Skull, that Anna Mitral Hedges left to her surviving husband. Apart from them, there could be others whose sale was not detected or recorded and that remain in private collections or forgotten in attics or basements. They may not be ancient artifacts, but they certainly have a history of their own at this point. I'm going to tell you about other artifacts that are actually ancient. But to conclude with hoaxes or artifacts that have been labeled as out of place based on dubious dating or understanding. These hoaxes are certainly the majority of cases. Sometimes because they were modern forgeries not necessarily to scam people, it can be pranks too. One prank that had its 15 minutes of fame about 10 years ago was called the Babylon Ocker. A clay tablet created as an artwork in 2012 that looked like a mobile phone. It resembled a Babylonian tablet but with a keyboard and a screen. So the brand name Nokia was added to it. This was intended as a joke or as a curiosity. But when a photo of it circulated online, a few proponents or fans of alternative archaeology or fringe science took the bait and started to claim it was a centuries-old archaeological find. There were clickbait articles about it, but obviously it was too big and not credible enough, and it died down quickly. This kind of viral prank or forgery is not limited to the recent past. Another example is the Akambaro figures, thousands of small ceramic figurines, discovered in the 1940s in the Mexican city of Acambaro. These figurines represented people, animals, and also creatures that strongly resembled the dinosaurs. They were obviously man-made, and it was claimed that they were several thousand years old. You can imagine the implications. They would have been made long before the existence of modern paleontology and the first recreations of dinosaur bodies. So, huge thunderbolt for many scientific disciplines, if this was true because it would have suggested that men and dinosaurs coexisted when they were thought to be millions of years apart. And not just for paleontology and the history of Earth, some figurines were also claimed to represent ancient Egyptians, Sumerians, or bearded Caucasians from the Old World, but they would have been made thousands of years ago in America. The entire timeline of man and migrations would have been challenged. The story was picked up by some, in that case by young Earth creationists, people who believe Earth was created a few thousand years ago, based on their interpretation of the Book of Genesis. Some of them reject the existence of dinosaurs, saying they are an invention. But the majority accepts dinosaurs and just argues that they had to coexist with mankind. 
this puts them at odds with the mainstream science and history. From geology and paleontology to astronomy and biology. So proof that all these disciplines might be in the wrong and that the history of Earth was thousands of times shorter than they said was a windfall for them. What if these figurines were that proof? But when the figurines were dated it appeared that they had been fired very recently, in the 1930s or 1940s. In other words, they were brand new, and they had uh, most probably been made by the farmers of the area. There was demand to satisfy from French scientists or young earth creationists who wanted to acquire them, so they kept producing more figurines and, in total, they made more than 30,000. But everything was fake, and this hoax deflated in the 1970s. It is now mostly forgotten. Before I tell you of more serious cases, here is a, a last example of hoax or forgery, and it's a good one the Michigan relics, a series of alleged archaeological finds in Michigan at the turn of the 20th century. If true, these would have been absolutely groundbreaking, because they would have indicated contact in ancient times between America and one or several ancient Near Eastern cultures. There were coins, boxes, cuneiform tablets, that is to say, clay tablets with cuneiform writing, the writing of ancient Mesopotamia. And some tablets even depicted biblical scenes, including Moses handing out the tablets of the Ten Commandments. What if the lost tribes of Israel had traveled to Michigan? We have to put this in the context of the late 19th century. Most scholars would have been very skeptical of these finds at the time. And they were, actually. But the timeline of mankind's history was still being revised regularly. The dating of objects using geological or archaeological layers where they were found was still quite unprecise, and there were no dating methods such as radiocarbon. This was also a time when there was a, a frenzy to unearth ancient artifacts in America. Not only artifacts, dinosaur bones were also searched actively. In any case, Several scholars went to examine and assess the relics that were provided in large quantities with regular finds by two men, James Scottford and Daniel Sopper. Most of these scholars concluded quickly that these were forgeries, and not very good ones, based on several observations. The cuneiform characters were indeed similar to Mesopotamian writing, but they were put in random order. They made no sense. They also noticed that the surface of many objects were perfectly smooth, and this indicated that they had been dried on a board that had been mechanically sewed. The first mechanical sewing machines appeared in the 19th century. They were known in antiquity. And finally, they observed that the objects quickly disintegrated in water. So they could not have possibly been buried in the ground. They would have disappeared long before they were found. 
despite the skepticism of the scientific community that never took these relics seriously. These Michigan relics had success with collectors and also with some members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. These Michigan relics echoed a story from one of the foundational sacred books of this church, the Book of Mormon. It is said in it that a society that is now extinct lived on the American continent long before Europeans arrived, a Judeo-Christian society that knew and adhered to the Bible. So these discoveries were perfect to support the belief that this society had existed. Maybe a bit too perfect. And it might have been that story from the Book of Mormons that inspired the forgery. Not all Mormons believed these artifacts were authentic. They had their doubts, but enough bought into the story and began to buy hundreds of them and uh, collect them. Scott Fudd and Soper kept uncovering objects, in reality making them, for two decades. In 1907, for example, they were reported to be selling copper crowns that they had supposedly found on the heads of prehistorical kings. And even more impressive, they were selling copies of Noah's diary, the same Noah from the biblical flood and the ark. And they found believers who paid for this. Finally, their fraud died down after their death in the 1920s and the Michigan relics were slowly forgotten. The Mormon church kept hundreds of them in their Salt Lake City Museum until 2003, when they were donated to the Michigan History Museum in Lansing, where they are now kept. But many more were fabricated, possibly thousands, over a period of more than 20 years. So these were examples of frauds. And I intentionally started with some of them, there are many, many more, to illustrate how one should be cautious when spectacular claims of discoveries or alternative theories are made in the fields of archaeology and history. Frauds and outlandish claims for attention or money are not rare, occasional things. They abound. There were groundbreaking discoveries in the history of sciences and out of principle every theory should always be questioned. We really have to keep an open mind, but any claim that ignores inconvenient proof or is presented with conspiracy undertones, as if there was some sort of big archaeology out there working to hide the truth, this should always be considered with extra caution. We still have different artifacts to go through. And these ones are genuinely old and raise interesting questions. First, let's talk about the Shroud of Turin. In 1578, 450 years ago, one of the most venerated relics of Christendom was transported to Turin, Italy, from Chambéry which is now in France, but at the time both cities were part of the Duchy of Savoy. This relic was a large rectangular linen cloth 
believed to be the shroud of Jesus of Nazareth, crucified, buried, and resurrected. On the shroud appeared the faint image of a man's body, with a beard and shoulder-length hair. The man is rather muscular and tall. Various modern experts have measured him as from 1.7 to 1.88 meters. This is 5 feet 7 to 6 feet 2 inches. An unusual but not extraordinary height for antique or medieval times. Reddish brown stains are found on the cloth, around the forehead, the hands and the feet, correlating with the wounds in the biblical description of the crucifixion of Jesus. On top of the crucifixion itself, the Bible says that Jesus also wore a crown of thorns. Forty-six years before its transportation to Turin, the cloth had been damaged by fire in uh, the chapel where it was kept in Chambéry. It didn't burn, but molten silver fell on it while it was folded and burned through it, which left holes and uh, darker traces. In the years after the fire, nuns repaired the cloth with various triangular patches that were sewn onto it and are still in place. But the known record of this cloth is older than the 16th century. In the 15th century, at the end of the Middle Ages, the piece was given to the House of Savoy, deeded to the Dukes of Savoy, we don't know with certainty where it was before. Records of the 13th and 14th centuries across Europe actually mention various places where a shroud of Jesus Christ was kept and venerated. It sounds absurd, but it was nothing out of the ordinary in the Middle Ages. Many relics that should be unique, like pieces of the True Cross or remains of apostles, were claimed to be in different locations. The origin of these relics was often dubious. They had been acquired and offered to churches and cathedrals, sometimes brought back from the Holy Land during the Crusades, but there were gaps of several centuries where tracks of these objects were non-existent, especially for relics related to the time of Jesus. And it is likely that most of them were fabrications. But still, if it was credible enough, a relic could reach high prices even just a tooth or a bone from a saint. And there were people simply producing them, forging relics. The church was aware of this and would obviously severely condemn the fabrication of fake relics. But in its doctrine, relics were not seen as central to the faith. If they could galvanize people's faith, help them pray because they needed something more tangible or material to hang to, and if it drew them to actively belong to the church, they were not a bad thing, and so their veneration was not particularly encouraged, but it was tolerated and respected. The burial shroud of Jesus was no exception, there were various reports of it in various locations. Just to name a few, for example, the Byzantine emperors had one, 
and its trace got lost in 1204 during the sack of Constantinople during the Crusades. Another shroud appeared by the mid-14th century in a French village. We don't know what happened to the Constantinople shroud. Maybe it traveled and ended up in Turin, even though that sounds unlikely, given the radiocarbon dating I will tell you about in a minute. Because the shroud of Turin would have been made after the sack of Constantinople, if we accept the results of this dating. So we don't know the history of this particular artifact before the 15th century, but since then it is well recorded. A chapel was built for it in the 17th century, and it was regularly put on public display. For the first time it was photographed in 1898, and this is when it really rose to fame among Catholic relics. Because in its original colors, it showed a rather faint image of the body and the face. But the negative image that was obtained by the photographer, on a black rather than white yellowish background, was much more defined and visually striking. With it, devotion to the Turin Shroud reached new heights. But still, the authenticity was always questioned, including by the Catholic Church that never confirmed nor denied that it was the one, the real Shroud. The authenticity of the Shroud was attacked on the basis of the Gospels. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke state that the body of Jesus was wrapped in a piece of linen cloth, so that seems coherent. But the Gospel of John says strips of linen were used instead. Based on John's version, there would be no shroud of Jesus in a single piece. But investigation with a more scientific approach really started in the 20th century. In 1978, pigments were taken from the shroud and examined with microscopes. The team of investigators concluded that the image was a painting. The pigments that give the reddish color were red ochre, they would have been applied in a kind of gelatinous medium. As it happens, this technique was known and used by some painters in the 14th century. And they found another pigment, vermilion, that was used to highlight the alleged bloodstains. But they didn't find any trace of actual blood in the samples taken from the shroud. So in the 1980s, the idea that it could well be a medieval painting gained traction. In 1988, a radiocarbon dating was allowed, and other samples were taken from the cloth. This analysis concluded that the shroud material dated from the 13th or 14th century still old, but much too recent to have been associated with Jesus. This analysis was contested with arguments that are sensible. What if there had been medieval repairs to the shroud and the samples had been taken from them instead of the original fabric? Or what if the results of the radiocarbon dating had been contaminated by carbon monoxide because it was established that the clothes was taken at least once in a fire? These arguments were refuted convincingly 
but with the progress in radiocarbon dating since the 1980s, the results were questioned a bit. And the consensus today is that the stated date range should be extended by almost a century to really be confident in the results. But still, the cloth would still be more than a thousand years too recent to be authentic. Other approaches included looking at the weaving of the fabric. The linen cloth has a, a so-called herringbone weave, which means it has a distinctive V-shaped weaving pattern. And here again, it tends to dismiss its authenticity because this kind of weaving was absent from all known fabrics from Palestine at the time of Jesus. Yet other approaches were tried, like the anatomical one, trying to determine whether the proportions of the body were realistic. They seem to be so visually, and even if it is a painting, a real body could have been used as a model, possibly covered in pigments and wrapped in the cloth for a quick result. But various experts have argued that some things were off with the proportions. The arms would be too long, with a marked difference in length between them. The forehead on the shroud would be too small, and yet another problem, a serious one, is that this image of a human body is not consistent with what you would get wrapping a real body or a statue in a cloth. You would get much more distortion of the proportions, whereas this image looks more like a photograph transferred to fabric. This raises the unsolved question of how it was made. It looks possible, but complicated. Complicated because to be credible, the cloth already had to look old when it arrived in Savoy in the 15th century. It could have been artificially aged by exposing it to the sun and dust but that would take time and uh, require planning. We also don't know how the image was created. It could have been painted directly. That would explain the proportion issues of the body. But even though the technique employed could be coherent with the techniques of the time of the 13th, 14th centuries, also coherent with the pigments known at the time and uh, the use of collagen to create this gelatinous medium to paint on. It would still have taken a master painter to get such a result. Another hypothesis would be a kind of medieval photography obtained by exposing a body to sunlight for a long time and with its reflection passing through a lens projected onto the cloth. This could have possibly slowly permitted the replication of the image on the cloth. Even though the various techniques and equipment needed to do that would have been theoretically available in the Middle Ages, this possibility is seen as very remote, very unlikely. There would be no other known example of such a process in the Middle Ages, and this would be uh, puzzling, because if it worked, it would certainly have been done more than once. Another hypothesis is the possibility of transferring prints from a person covered in pigments, but doing only small parts at a time to avoid these distortions that I mentioned earlier. It could have been the nose, the forehead, the eyes, and progressively the picture would have been recreated on the cloth 
assembling these prints of body parts. Or it could have been done by wrapping the cloth around a, a bas relief. Not a real body which is in 3D, but instead a board carved on both sides with uh, already a, a 2D sculpture of a man. This could give the result visible on the cloth. So as you see, the Shroud of Turin may well be a forgery, but at least it is an extremely uh, well thought and well executed one, so well that to this day there are various hypotheses that are plausible but we still don't precisely know how it was made sometime during the Middle Ages. Our next story is about a technological curiosity. A pillar made of iron 1600 years ago that apparently doesn't rust despite centuries of exposure to moisture. It was made in India under Emperor Chandragupta II, who reigned at the turn of the 4th century AD. It is relatively high for an antique metal structure, more than 7 meters high, that's 23 feet, and its diameter is 41 centimeters, 16 inches. The pillar is made of almost pure iron at more than 99%. This is nice but nothing extraordinary. At this point, iron metallurgy was already well established across the ancient world and many other iron objects were made in India, including centuries earlier than that. What is more intriguing is that the pillar seems to be protected against rust. Apart from traces of rust near its base, it has remained intact since then. It is thought it was first erected elsewhere and was moved to its present location in Delhi in the 11th century. For a long time, this resistance to rust was really puzzling because rust-resistant steel or coatings on iron to make it impervious to rust are inventions of modern times. How could an iron pillar from the 4th or 5th century be rust-proof? And did it mean the metallurgy of ancient Indians was way more advanced than thought? This is the mystery that made the Iron Pillar of Delhi an out-of-place artifact. Its existence seems to suggest a level of technological advancement incompatible with the generally admitted timeline. So, by the mid-20th century, the pillar was sometimes mentioned in fringe science circles as proof of extraterrestrial visitation or evidence that an unknown ancient civilization would have had an advanced technological level. But further investigation provided an explanation for the phenomenon and it has to do with the particular metal composition of the pillar. Even though the pillar is mostly iron, it also contains phosphorus, coming from charcoal mixed with iron ore in the fabrication process. Typically, this phosphorus is considered an impurity, and in modern blast furnaces, there is much less of it because coal is used rather than charcoal, and phosphorus is evacuated so it is absent from the finished product. But in the pillar of Delhi, the concentration of phosphorus approaches 1%. And when the pillar was left exposed to atmospheric conditions, 
This phosphorus acted as a catalyst for several chemical reactions with oxygen and hydrogen that created a very thin protective layer on it. Very thin, way less than a millimeter. But it isolates the iron inside the pillar from direct contact with the air and from oxidation. This is how the pillar became rust-proof or rust-resistant. It didn't have this property immediately when it was cast, but in a few years, this coating, this protective layer, appeared and made it naturally resistant to rust. So this pillar is an example of out-of-place artifact based on a lack of understanding of a natural mechanism. Since the explanation has been found out, it is no longer one. Now, one last for the road, but not the least. Let me tell you about the Antikythera mechanism. This mystery began in 1901, when the wreck of an ancient Roman cargo ship was found and explored near the Greek island of Antikythera. In the wreck that had waited at a depth of 45 meters or 150 feet underwater for more than 2000 years, they found considerable treasures, archaeological treasures, bronze and marble statues. There was also glassware, jewelry, coins, and a strange lump, a mass of corroded bronze and wood that initially did not draw much interest because the other finds looked much more interesting. But further examination revealed that a gear wheel was embedded in the thing. And so that it appeared to be a sort of mechanism. One Greek archaeologist formulated the hypothesis that it could be some sort of astronomical clock. But at the time, most other scholars considered that it was unthinkable that the Romans or the Greeks from antiquity could have created such a complex machine. So the hypothesis was not taken seriously. Maybe it was something else or an artifact dropped into the sea centuries after the wreckage. And for a long time, for several decades, the remains were almost ignored. They were kept together, and other pieces found around the wreck were stored with it, but it didn't attract much interest. Until the second half of the 20th century, this unknown set of pieces that looked like gears, or sometimes just metal scraps, was studied with more attention. The pieces were scrutinized with microscopes and x-rays, and it appeared that they formed an ancient machine indeed. At this point, the initial single encrusted piece found in the wreck had fractured into smaller pieces with time and handling, revealing that this lump was actually made of plenty of parts dented wheels, spirals, some of them with inscriptions that showed the moon, calendar inscriptions in Greek, and zodiac inscriptions. All these parts could only belong to a machine, a mechanism. And with these inscriptions, this mechanism appeared to be related to astronomy. Other remains indicated it was contained inside a wooden box, and bit by bit, with many fragments still missing, the function of this machine was found out. It was used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses, 
condensing much of the knowledge ancient Greeks had acquired about cycles in the skies. Cycles of the five planets they knew. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. The Moon, including the slightly irregular orbits that these bodies have. And the complexity of the mechanism suggests it could predict astronomic positions of these bodies decades in advance. Probably not with the accuracy we have today, but certainly at a level that was not reached again before the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance, 1500 years later. It didn't really surprise anyone that the ancient Greeks had this kind of theoretical knowledge, the one about astronomy. This was already known. But the fact that they were able to create a machine with all the precision engineering and workmanship this required, this was really unheard of. The machine basically worked as an analog computer. That is to say, one that uses a physical phenomenon, like the regular oscillation of something, or the movement of gears, to model, calculate, solve another physical phenomenon. Digital computers, that we abundantly use nowadays, do not work like this. They represent quantities symbolically, with numbers, and they use digital signals. Whereas an analog system replaces a physical phenomenon with another one, to be able to anticipate on the first phenomenon. To give you a concrete example, a mechanical watch, one with gears that rotate continuously inside, and drive the needles that indicate seconds, minutes and hours in the clock. This is an example of analog computer. The rotation of the gears models and follows on its own the passing of time. Such analog computers were the first computing machines built. But it was unknown that the Greeks had made one or, more likely, several ones, because the degree of complexity of the Antikythera mechanism makes it hard to believe that it was the first ever made. There should have been predecessors, probably simpler, that evolved into this particular machine. But none of these mechanisms, or even records of their existence, are known. The dating of the Antikythera mechanism remains a bit uncertain. It could have been made as early as 200 BC, since Hellenistic scientists of this period had just acquired, modeled the knowledge necessary especially the observation that the cycles of the moon are slightly irregular. The shipwreck was dated to about 70 to 60 BC, so that gives a time slot of 130 to 140 years, within which the machine could have been built between 200 BC and 60-70 BC. A time when the Roman Republic was expanding politically and commercially. The ship was found near a Greek island, but you remember it was Roman. And so Roman domination was on the rise around the Mediterranean. But at the time, Hellenistic culture, that is to say Greek culture in and out of Greece after the expansion of Alexander the Great's empire, Hellenistic culture was very influent in the Mediterranean and the Middle East, at the vanguard of scientific discoveries or the creation of libraries. So, this machine may not have changed the course of history, 
as far as we know, it is the most advanced computing mechanism produced in antiquity worldwide. And there doesn't seem to have been further developments, or at least they have not been found. So even though it may not have been the only one, it remains exceptional. There was no computing science in antiquity. But it certainly brought renewed appreciation for the ingenuity of antique astronomers, mathematicians and engineers. After this know-how was lost, which may have happened before the end of antiquity, maybe because there was not enough interest in these machines and they were only seen as mere curiosities, but after that it took about 1500 years to build again astronomical clocks with similar complexity. This happened by the late Middle Ages in the 14th and 15th centuries. I took the example of mechanical watches to explain what an analog computer is. Big mechanical clocks also appeared in the Middle Ages, but the miniaturized version of them, watches, were very rare and unprecise until the 18th century. Before that period, they typically drifted by several seconds in a day. It is only in the late 18th century that very accurate watches started to be made. And until the development of electronics in the 20th century, all watches remained mechanical. Various replicas and reconstructions of the Antikythera mechanism have been made to investigate and demonstrate how it may have looked and worked. The way the machine worked is understood in principle, not in details, because too many pieces are missing. Either they broke or got lost at sea or disintegrated under water where they spent 2000 years. But who knows? Maybe one day another of these machines will be found elsewhere and shed a new light on this antique technological marvel. We have reached the end of our journey for tonight. I hope you liked it and now you can let go and fall asleep or pick another story from my library if you're not sleepy yet. I'll be back soon with a new one. But for now, sleep well, sweet dreams, au revoir.